Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we're doing a This Year in Perfume and we're actually all the way to 2017. And so the last couple videos were a little down. They were sort of tribute videos, if you will, to two amazing men, Alessandro Brun of uh, co-founder of Mask Milano and Claude Montana both passed away within a week of each other at the end of February 2024. So I feel like since this channel is all about fragrance content and um, fashion, well not fashion, but lots of fashion houses get dragged into the fragrance game, um, this is a topic that I really feel like I needed to cover. Those men needed to be honored for their um, contributions to the fragrance world. And um, even though Claude Montana's house ended up getting sold uh, in or went bankrupt in the 90s, basically, and so his name on the bottle, I think, was nothing more than just like, um, you know, I don't think he had anything to do with any of the releases past the 1990s for his house. Um, you know, the fact that uh, his name was on the tin had to be sort of honored. So now that those sadder videos are kind of out of the way, we're back to the celebration of fragrances. And it's Friday evening. I'm going to go work out after this. I worked all day, but you know what? I feel like I have, excuse me, I have to do this type of content for you guys because um, I'm loving knocking these videos out and I'm in a trend and I really feel like when I get in a groove, I'm a very habitual, routine person and so I really feel like I'm in a groove with these this year in perfume. So we're going to go all the way up to 2024 and I'm going to wait to do the final this year in review or this year in perfume 2024 video at the end of the year this year. So uh, we'll knock out 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. It's crazy to think we still have six years after this. Um, but 2017 is a tough year to talk about because this is the year where I really feel like everything started to get hyper, hyper politicized here in America. I can't even look up the like historical news without it being in my face. It's like Trump's inauguration and Russian collusion. I'm like, no, actually, wait a minute. That was all based off of that fake Christopher Steele dossier that they used to spy on Trump and his campaign. So now that it, we're in 2024 and we kind of know what happened, uh, it's, it's hard to read some of this stuff. But Trump's... Uh, inauguration, a divisive election, as the news says. Um, it's almost like anything the news says is is one way. You almost know it's kind of the opposite. That's how crazy it's gotten. Um, it's just gotten so 1984-ish here in America. It's nuts. But um, Trump inauguration, uh, Russia's election meddling, uh, the Roy, Roy Nigia refugee crisis. So Myanmar stepped up its attack, uh, and, and that was a big thing in 2017. Uh, Rocket Man, North Korea's missile launch. You probably remember that being in the news in 2017. Um, there, there was the largest Super Bowl comeback of all time by the New England Patriots, who I absolutely despise. Uh, although I respect them for their ability to win at all costs, I despise the Patriots, uh, especially since Tom Brady's first Super Bowl came off of the uh, fake tuck rule against my uh, beloved Raiders, and it's been all downhill ever since then. Uh, the NFL anthem protest. So again, this is not a political channel, but my personal feeling on that is I do think that you should stand for the flag, uh, especially in a country where you're making millions of dollars as an NFL football player. Uh, was not a fan of the uh, kneeling, let's say, many people turned away from the NFL at this time and never watched again. I'm actually a fan. Um, I know I'm wasting my uh, time. My, my neighbor says, why are you watching sports ball? It's so stupid. Uh, and it, in, in a nutshell, it kind of is. But so is, you know, you could say talking about fragrances on the internet is stupid as well. So, um, you know, you have to have hobbies and hopefully some of them are more cultured or more um, beneficial than just sitting there and, and watching football or hockey or whatever your sport is. I love hockey, by the way. Um, I think hockey is kind of the, the last bastion of sports that haven't been completely pussified. You know, in football, everything's a flag. It's like, can't hit them in the head, can't hit them in the knees. You have to hit them like in this exact spot. And oh, if you do hit them in that exact spot, but you fall on them, it's a foul anyway. So I don't think the NFL needs to necessarily rig games. I think just at one or two calls one way or another can push a game which are so close. The league is so close. There's so much parity now. All it takes is one or two calls and bam, that's it. Your team that you want to win, if you're the NFL, is going to win. Hint, hint. So um, let's see, what else happened? Snapchat IPA, uh, IPO, ah, fake news came out. But the news, if you read about it, they're telling us how great Facebook is for actually removing these fake news or troll accounts. But really, it feels like Facebook is the troll. Um, 
Let's see, some stuff on Confederate monuments coming down. Las Vegas shooting happened in 2017. That was a big thing. Um, and they're talking about things like the opioid epidemic, which I'm sure the open borders have a lot to do with. And um, wildfires across the globe. Okay, so that was the hyper-politicized this year in news, 2017. That kind of puts us back in the framework of what was going on in 2017. Some, some songs, according to... Um, sources from the web. I just googled top 10 songs. So, Shape of You, Humble, Closer, Body Like a Back Road, Stay, Feel It Still, Bad Liar, uh, Despatio, Bad and, bad and Jew, Bougie, Attention, uh, Wild Thoughts, Issues, Something Just Like This, Bodak Yellow, what is that? Believer, Slow Hands, Congratulations, Unforgettable. So, apparently those are the uh, top songs of 2017. How do I not know any of those? Um, and top 10 movies of 2017, according to the interwebs, says uh, the best movies of 2017, according to IMDb, you've got Okja, never heard of it, uh, Call Me By Your Name, never heard of it, Blade Runner 2049, I heard of that one, uh, never seen it, Lady Bird, The Shape of Water, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, Molly's Game, Murder of the Orient Express, Dunkirk, that was a good movie, I think. No, wait a minute. That was not a good movie. I hated Dunkirk. Dunkirk was the one where um, there was like one HE-111 in the entire movie. Like Dunkirk, there were people everywhere. There's like one person standing on the beach, one plane. I was like, what the hell is this that I'm watching? Um, a Cure for Wellness, The Mercy, Hostiles, The War... War for the Planet of the Apes, which they're making another remake of the Planet of the Apes series, just in case you can't figure out that they are completely out of ideas in Hollywood. John Wick Chapter 2, that was a good movie. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Thor Ragnarok, The Lost City of Z, Alien Covenant, Wonder Woman, and Star Wars Episode 8, The Last Jedi. So that was some... Uh, movies from 2017. So that gets us back into the mindset. So let's do Scent of the Day. Scent of the Day is a harbinger of things to come because 2017 for me is kind of the year, the rise of the uh, artisanal houses, okay? And I use the artisanal houses to encompass things like Ensar, which is my Scent of the Day today. Uh, it is so easy for me just to grab this and spray it on and wear it. Like, I, found, I find myself craving these type of fragrances and a very wise person once told me, you have to follow your nose. Don't listen to what other people tell you. Follow your nose and your heart because you smell with your brain, your heart, your soul. You smell with uh, more than just your nose. This is more than just notes, okay? Fragrances have deeper meaning. And, and for, sometimes you learn more about yourself exploring these fragrances than you do the fragrance itself. This fragrance is, I am convinced, it's an absolute masterpiece for me, for my personal taste, because I have a huge love of leather. If you know me, I am an absolute leather nut. And um, this is full grain leather. This outer bar part that the bottle actually sits in um, is created by the same guy who, create, who created the leather bindings for the Pope's Bible. He's a very well-known leather maker. And if you, you can see kind of the, um, see full grain leather has imperfections. And that's one of the reasons why these big brands like Hermes and, um, you know, Chanel bags and stuff like that. They don't like using full grain leather because it has imperfections and everyone wants to be exactly perfect and cookie cutter, right? So they have other techniques that they use, but um, this is absolutely phenomenal. And the fragrance has grown on me more and more and more and more. And actually just NSARs in general have grown on me more and more and more and more. And I would love a bottle of EO number two. I would love to try some of his musks. I know some friends that I really trust have um, deep admiration and great things to say about things like Tonkin musk and some of the private blends and royal blends and all the stuff Ansar does. He gets his hands on some amazing stuff. So next year, for the This Year in Perfume 2018 edition, this will be very close to the top. And look at the color of the juice. Um, it is absolutely phenomenal. I've got... Uh, another bottle that's maybe half full, and this is just, I mean, I'm in love with it, honestly, and, it, and this could easily be a signature scent for me because it checks all my boxes, um, it hits that leathery castorium, but it gives you that Ensar sparkle, and what I love about it, when I say Ensar sparkle, I'm usually talking about 
this sort of ambergris-like feel that he has put in many of his perfumes. They just seem almost like a stone skipping across the top of the water, but it's leather. It's castorium. It's very rare um, um, sort of ouds in, in here. So there's Assam oud, papau sandalwood, ambergris, tobacco, multiple different types of rose, Himalayan rose, Gaiac, Gallic rose, excuse me, Turkish rose, bourbon rose, jasmine, Thai oud, civet, nutmeg, rosewood. I love rosewood. There's a little bit of lavender and of course the castorium, which is a big part of it. And I believe there's real musks in here, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe there's not real musk in this one. Maybe that's EO number two. I think it's EO number two. This is more about the oud, the leathers, and a little bit of Ethiopian frankincense. And it all just blends together in a way that just makes this fragrance so easy for me to just pick up and spray. I mean, it's just, I've reviewed it on the channel, but I've come to love it even more since I've done the review. So this is uh, EO number one by uh, Ensar. Love to smell more work from Ensar one day. He has so many fragrances. You know, I was wearing uh, Oud Sultani to bed yesterday. Fuck, what a, fra what a Oud oil that is. Not even a fragrance, just a Oud oil. Just completely blown away. So, um, so yes, you have to be, you have to be well off to buy Ensar's is the problem. I was looking at his website and all the fragrances on the front page are like $3,200, $2,500. I'm like, Jesus. Um, so yes, that is the, uh, if you are a, a Saudi Arabian sheikh, that is what you buy. So, um, okay, so let's get started. This is going to be a top 35, but first, before we do our rankings, I want to do some honorary mentions, some fragrances that I have decants of or samples, branded samples or something like that, but I have not done full reviews on the channel yet. So if you know my rules, my rules are in order to be in the list, it's either a full bottle uh, or it is a sample that I have reviewed the fragrance. So if I've reviewed it and it's on the channel and you can just go look up the review and learn about it for yourself, I'm putting it in the ranking. And I completely shot myself in the foot by doing that because it swelled these lists to huge amounts because I have been a very hard working Ram over the last couple of years and I've done many reviews and now we're coming back and those reviews are like biting me in the ass because I'm having to put them in, in this list. So here's some fragrances that have not gotten individual reviews, although some of them have been discussed on the channel via live stream. So um, if you don't mind some shoddy video quality, you can go check out some of my live streams. For example, Amwaj, Beach Hut Woman, and Figment Woman both came out in 2017. Uh, and there's women's Amwaj focused live streams where I discuss those two fragrances. Also Argos, uh, which I've done a review or two on the channel recently. Argos is a brand which actually I thought I was going to hate and I wanted to hate them because they're like an influencer brand, but I haven't been as disappointed as I was expected to be. So that's a good thing. So um, Argos has a fragrance called Pour Homme and Pour Femme that came out in 2017. Uh, Atelier d'Ors has Iris Fowl, which I have a sample of somewhere, God knows where. Uh, that came out in 2017. Dubai number nine, uh, Bond number nine Dubai Gold came out in 2017. I've got a sample of that. Ducita Les Sièges Blanc. Actually, I have the whole Ducita sample set, so I can do some Ducita reviews very soon. Fort and Manly, Harem Rose. There is a Fort and Manly live stream on the channel if you want to learn more about that brand. Gallagher Fragrances Amongst the Waves. Hiram Green Slow Dive. There's a Hiram Green uh, live stream on the channel if you want to check out my thoughts on some of their fragrances. Histoire de Parfum On Aparte Irreverent, which actually is not a bad fragrance. I've been testing that one uh, over the last, actually like six months or so, and um, just spraying it occasionally, and I like it so far. Uh, House of Matriarch, The Longing, and Tuka Tao, Tuka Ta Tao, hell of a name for a fragrance. So The Longing is one fragrance, Tuka Tao, Ta Tao is another. Imaginary Authors, O Unknown, um, there'll be some more Imaginary Authors reviews soon, I've only reviewed one on the channel, um, and also Whispered Myths, those both came out in 2017. January Scent Project, Eider Antler, there's a January Scent Project live stream on the channel, and John Beeble, the owner and perfumer, came onto the channel to do a um, interview. So if you want to check those out, if you're interested in learning more about that brand, you can. Joe Malone's Myrrh and Tonka, which usually I have not been getting the samples, but this one's right here, so screw it. I will show you. Uh, although maybe this was a bad idea. Oh! <sighs> So Myrrh and Tonka, look at this little cute little thing someone sent me. I think someone on Mercari sent this to me when I bought a fragrance from them. They have since changed their packaging. So can you believe it? Vintage Joe Malone. Who would have ever thought it? Um, 
but this is actually pretty good. I do not like the brand of Joe Malone. In fact, you could almost go as far as to say I despise the brand of Joe Malone. They're everything I hate. They're very ethereal, airy. They only last a couple hours normally, and then they're gone. Um, but this one is pretty good. Myrrh and Tonka may, may be the best sort of... Um, it's an intense cologne, a cologne intense. So, um, yes, I'll review this on the channel one of these days. So, um, I'm actually very interested in wearing that and getting to know it more. Juice Box Black Powder, which is probably my favorite juice box. Um, and the other one was called Live in La Live and Loud. Um, Live and Loud was okay. Black Powder was pretty good. Uh, Lesson Demo Dabla's Iris Pearl, which is probably my least favorite Lesson Demo Dabla's. Although it's a good fragrance, it's not my favorite take on Iris. Um, Mancera's Black Gold, which I have a very generous sample of, and I've been dreading wearing that to do a review for you guys, but one day I will. And Red Tobacco. Um, Mask Milano Mandala. Uh, Raymond Monegal Soul of Oud. Uh, Rasasi Sator Wa. Roja's Elysium Poron Parfum, one of the few Roja's that I have a pretty um, generous sample of that I have not done a review on the channel yet. Most of the Ro Roja's in my collection have been done uh, full reviews on the channel, and there's a lot of um, Roja reviews to, to check out a whole. You can go to my playlist and watch all of them if you're interested in just Roja-ing out. Uh, Rosendu Matu, rest in peace, number five, Floral Amber uh, Sensual Musk is the name of that one. That was very hyped on YouTube for a while, and it is extremely, extremely sweet. Very hard for me to wear that one. Strange Love Fall Into Flowers. That's a fantastic fragrance and a great brand. Um, Sultan Pasha has a couple that are in my sample set from 2017. One is called Diwan, uh, Diwania, Diwania, and the other is called Iris Soar. Iris, O-I-R, Iris Soar. Um, very interested in learning more about his fragrances, but the sample sets come in these tiny, I mean, you got to use like a paper clip and just put a tiny little drop and rub it in. And so I may have to like, just wear those before bed occasionally and just give like a first impression and, and move on. Um, he also has one in that collection called Le Rayon Vert from 2017. I'm excited to get to know. And finally, Zerzhov has Ceylon, which I actually liked some of Zerzhov's Oud collection line or whatever they call their oud line um ceylon was pretty good i do not have a re review of it on the channel but i think there's a zerzhoff live stream where i discuss it uh briefly and then there's a zoologist live streams actually multiple zoologist live streams uh dragonfly and panda were remaked i be believe in 2017 and elephant was its own fragrance in 2017 elephant was fantastic that was maybe one of the biggest shocks of the whole zoologist line um, I expected to like some and not like some, but Elephant caught me off guard, I think, by how much I like. I think that's the right one. There's so many, it's hard to keep up. Um, Elephant, really, I thought that was full bottle worthy. It was great. Uh, very unique fragrance. Fantastic stuff. Like, I would own a bottle of that. Probably one of the better zoologists. Um, and we're going to talk about a zoologist today from 2017. So, a top 35. I must warn you, as I've said many times before, before we get going, especially on this one, this is the artisanal year. Um, and so you're going to see a lot of Aries Ladores towards the top. This is my personal ranking. This is how I feel right now. Uh, many people say once you go into that artisanal world of Ensars and Aries and Bortnikovs, it's very hard to come back, and I completely see why they say that. Um, and so keep in mind, I'm not saying number one's better than number 35. I'm just saying this is my personal taste. And if you ask me tomorrow, it could change, right? So this is just a fun way to talk about a lot of different fragrances. So please do not get offended. I'm not saying if your favorite fragrance is number 35 on the list, don't be all butthurt about it. So, um, number 35, we have a fragrance from the House of Strangers, Parfumerie, and this is called Cigar Rum. So, I'm going to review this soon, mostly because um, I am not impressed with this. And actually, you know what? I can't remember if I reviewed this already or not. I, I may have. I'll have to check. I've done a lot of reviews from the house of... Prin has a problem with his naming. He has like Prin, P-R-I-N, Prin, P-R-Y-N, Parfum, Prisana, and Strangers Perfume. He has like all these houses. They're different names. And sometimes fragrances I hear cross over or it's just a complete cluster. It's like the most messed up line chart you could ever imagine. But uh, Cigar Rum is... One of his most hyped fragrances, and I bought this blind just because I was interested to see what, you know, his, this is before I smelled any of his other works. This was the first thing from him I ever smelled. 
very, very disappointed in this. Um, it is a take on a tobacco, um, there's supposed to be like this prune, like dried cherry note mixing with the tobacco, but there's a kelp note. So it's almost like a tobacco on a, on a, on a beach. Okay. So there's that, um, summer nights feel. Imagine like cool summer nights on a beach, kelp from the waves coming in and resins, raisins, resins and raisins, uh, a little bit of labdanum, but the thing about it is honestly, and this is crazy to say, but I prefer wearing Nishan A's Fan Your Flames. Uh, I thought this was actually going to be better than Fan Your Flames, but there's something about this that just doesn't work for me. Very boring um, when I thought it would be the opposite of that. So Fan Your Flames uh, is actually, I enjoy wearing more than cigar rum, but they both sort of play in a similar beach, if you will. Um, so this is kind of a woody, spicy, very generic. The reason that uh, Prin named it Strangers is apparently creating the, these type of mass appealing fragrances are like a stranger to him. So hearty har har. But um, I was not a fan, let's say. And, um, you know, Prin, uh, we'll talk more about Prin as the fragrance goes on, as the fragrance video goes on, because there are definitely some Prin fragrances in this ranking. Like I said, this is the artisanal year. So you're going to see Prins, you're going to see uh, Aris La Dore's, and you're going to see some, what I would consider almost artisanal style houses, but not done with the rare ouds and stuff like that of Aris La Dore's from houses like January Scent Project and stuff like that in 2017. Okay, so number 34. Uh, we're moving on to a Dior fragrance, a Christian Dior, and I thought this was like the 2012 version because of the C and the D being split on the cap. I was like, oh, this is an older bottle. Actually, it turned out to be a 2017 version of Dior Homme Sport. I thought this was the 2012, although I'm happy with this. Um, I think I like Dior Homme O better, E A. Excuse me, E A U, which is discontinued. It came in like a blue juice. Uh, it looked, it looked almost blue. I've got a decant um, somewhere. And um, I will review it, but I think that's the better uh, warm weather Dior Homme. The problem with uh, Dior Homme, though, is I, I love wearing it in warm weather. Like, I don't think it needed a sport fragrance. I think it was perfectly fine with what it was. Um, I think Dior Homme works perfect in, in the warmer weather for me. But some people say it's too much with the cacao and the powdery makeup -y iris and all that stuff. I get it, but um, I just think that when I wear this, sometimes I'm just like, why the hell didn't I just wear Dior Homme, which I much prefer. Uh, it, it is good. This one has a citron note in the top uh, with some blood orange and this uh, pear. And it's a little bit powdery with the soft LME from memory. Actually, you know what? We're going to spray some of these because why the hell not, right? So uno momento. Let's take a look. Um, let's grab some... Let's grab some of these bad boys right here. Yeah. All right, so we are set on uh, sprayers. So let's uh, let's spray this. It's been a while, and of course now I don't have a pen. Oh, oh. Dior Om Sport Sport. Let us spray. Ah, uh, the advantage of having a shitload of perfume. You can just spray away. Yes, so... Yes, it all comes back to me. On paper, uh, the opening is actually a little rough. It almost has a little bit of a cleaner vibe to it. But, it calms down very quickly. Give it 10-15 seconds, and you'll start to get elements of that grapefruit with the citron fruit, which is very rindy. Citron, if I remember, is a fruit that um, has very little juice or very little like meat inside. It's it almost feels like it's all rind, like hard uh, outer rind, and that's kind of the way that it smells. With a powdery take on elemi, uh, that pear note, nutmeg, pink pepper, Haitian vetiver, and sandalwood. And so to me, the reason I much prefer Dior Homme O is um, O kept that iris note, which is so prevalent here. If it is here, it's almost relegated to the back burner of um, just being pushed behind all of those fresh citrusy or cleaner notes. And I want, you know, how do you have a Dior Homme fragrance and not have that iris note? I don't know. But um, Dior Homme Sport from 2017 at number 34. Number 33 is a Lalique fragrance. And to be honest, one of the weaker Lalique fragrances. Not that it's a bad fragrance. It's just 
The other Laliques in my collection I think are much better than this. Ancre Noir series comes to mind, but this is called Ombre Noir. And Ombre Noir is a online exclusive from the House of Lalique. Uh, and Ombre Noir is supposed to be a Lalique Ombre Noir. So Ombre Noir um, is supposed to be their take on a boozy fragrance. All right, so this is Lalique's take on a boozy fragrance. Um, and the um, the sweetness is turned up a bit for my taste, although there are very interesting touches in here. So there is fig leaf, uh, peppermint, Italian bergamot, frankincense, tobacco, cinnamon, papyrus. I wish the papyrus was turned up a little bit more. Everyone focuses on the cognac note in the base, and it's definitely there. Um, um, with cedarwood, tonka, and myrrh. All right? And... Um, it's a good fragrance, a good spicy, woody, you know, I have a similar problem with this as that I have with um, the first couple of fragrances I mentioned. When it comes to, um, when it comes to like, if I wanted to wear a cognac fragrance, like I, I, Ombre Noir is not the first thing that comes to mind. I would reach for something like Overture Man or... Uh, there's so many other boozy type fragrances that uh, I would reach for before Ombre Noir is the first thing that comes to mind. I reviewed that Spirit of the Glen fragrance from DS and Durga. Fantastic boozy scotch, malt liquor, malt, um, you know, you get that um, um, bit on the bottom of the oak barrels, that residue, and, and that's exactly what that smells like. So Ombre Noir you know, it feels like a designer version of something that I have better fragrances of. Like, I would rather wear the the niche or, or what I would consider the better done liqueur fragrance before I reach for Ombre Noir. But if you're someone who is new to the liqueur side of things and you don't have the, the high-end Roja Cognac uh, Creation E and some of that in your collection, this is a great starter, um, fantastic starter boozy fragrance because... It brings in elements of sort of designer fragrances that are popular. Some people say it has Spice Bomb Extreme bits and pieces to it. Um, and I could kind of see that because of the tobacco and cinnamon and stuff like that. But Lalique does not do bad fragrances at all. They do fantastic. I've never smelled a Lalique fragrance that's bad. Every single Lalique fragrance that I've smelled is very competently done. Um, and... So they started to work with these boozy elements in 2016. I think I mentioned Lin Sao Mu. Uh, Lin, I've been saying Lin Sao Miss, Lin Sao Miss. Uh, and, the, and people kept telling me the S at the end is, is silent. So I guess it's supposed to be Lin Sao Mu, which sounds even worse to my ears, but I am not a Frenchman. Uh, but that had a boozy rum note. This has a boozy cognac. So Lalique has been working with these boozy notes lately. And um, this is still available, but it's an online exclusive. And if you wait... Since many people don't know it's an online exclusive, I don't think the sales of it are too are too good. Some people think it's discontinued. It's not just an online exclusive. Um, and so because of that, I think it hits discounters fairly regularly. I got that from fragrancebuy.ca uh, for like 50 bucks or something. So if you wait, you'll find it at discounters. Uh, but I think retail is like 130 So, okay, number uh, 32 is a decant. I was not able to go pull out all my decants, so you're just going to have to take my word on it. Uh, this is Burberry's Antique Oak. And Antique Oak, uh, I have a review on the channel. It's a Francis Kirkjohn uh, sort of high-end Burberry fragrance. Burberry tried to do this high-end line where they um, employed Francis Kirkjohn to create these. Uh, they called it like uh, Antique Oak, and I think there was a antique amber or something like that. Um, and so I believe Moudassir is the one who sent me the decant of this. One of them broke. So I think he did send me the amber and it broke. The oak did not break. So I was able to do the review of, of antique oak. And, you know, it's a good fragrance for what it is. I enjoy these type of fragrances though. Oud, papyrus, leather, and saffron. And, you know, for a Burberry fragrance, if you read those notes, you kind of have an idea exactly what it's going to smell like. And, and if you can think of Francis Kirkjohn then doing a fragrance like that, then you really have an idea of what it's going to smell like. And yet, I still enjoyed it. I liked it. Would I pay the $300 or whatever Burberry's trying to charge for it because it has a damn leather bow on it? Hell no. But uh, do I think it's a competently done uh, Francis Kirkjohn creation? Yes. Yes, I do. 
so Antique Oak at number 32. Number 31 is a Parfum de Marly, one of the few I was able to actually find the decant of, probably because it's so unique. I don't really have any decants like that in my collection, uh, but it looks like all the juice pretty much evaporated out of it, because um, I don't think I used it all. But this is um, Leighton Exclusif from Parfums de Marly. And you know what? Um, for all the shit Parfums de Marly gets, and it is well-deserved, uh, I would probably trade my bottle of Leighton for a bottle of Leighton Exclusif. I'd probably trade it in because the Exclusif version um, brings in deeper, darker elements. Is this, if you go read some Fragrantica reviews on some of these, they are hilarious. Like if you're ever just like bored out of your gourd and you want to laugh, go read some of the reviews for Leighton, for some of for some of the Exclusifs in general, not just Leighton, but you know, the deeper, darker ones that have oud, the people are hilarious. They're like, the most challenging animalic oud I've ever smelled. And I'm like, no, no, not even close. This is very um, likable, uh, very soft. It's almost like kitten play. There's no claws in this, but the oud does add a little bit more darkness to it. I have a full review on the channel if you want to check it out. Um, you know, lots of Cipriol and stuff like that to create that oud accord. But again, I like that style, that DNA. Uh, that doesn't turn me off. And they use the same perfumer who made Leighton uh, Hamid Marathi Kashani. So I'm glad that they did that. They brought him back for the uh, exclusive version. Okay. Excuse me whilst I hydrate. Today we're going with the big boy jug. Um, Daddy needs his water. Okay. So next on the list, we have number um, 30. And number 30 is a Ducita fragrance. Like I said, I have the entire Ducita. Actually, let me just grab it so I can show you real quick. Hang on. Uno momento. So somebody, one of my perfume god people, very generously uh, sent me the uh, entire sample set for Ducita, which has all of these little bad boys right there. I guess they don't list them right there, but um, uh, they're right here. So it has all of these right here. Um... And that's basically most of the original Ducita releases. Uh, and so, but one of them that I have reviewed on the channel before this actually came in, when when um, people just, I, somehow I accumulated a couple random Ducita samples that had the blurb and everything still attached to it. And one of them was called La, La Douceur de Siam. La Douceur de Siam. And I actually really enjoyed Le Douceur de Siam. I actually really enjoyed Ducita's work. Um, I think that uh, her work is pretty well done. Some people tried to put her in the sort of um, Roja Dove category where saying that she claims to be a perfumer, but there are some folks that say that's not true. Although um, others have told me that, no, I've actually seen her perfumer's organ. I've seen her mix the excuse me, that she actually is a proper perfumer. She's not in the Roja Dove category. But um, this uh, Le Douceur de Siam, I believe, is marketed uh, unisex. And I think most men would probably find this a little bit floral for their modern taste. There was a lot of rose and champaca and stuff like that. The write-up was um, a tribute to the sublime fragrances and gentle traditions of perfumer... Uh, Pissara's Siamese heritage, a, a sensual joy in traditional oriental fragrances. And so, you know, I remember there being a lot of rose uh, and a lot of florals, but I remember it being mixed with this, what the brand calls a Mysore sandalwood. One of my biggest pet peeves is calling something a Mysore sandalwood accord. Um, you know, and people reading it are probably thinking there's tons of real Mysore sandalwood in there, although in 2017 that would almost be impossible without spending huge amounts of money. Um, and so my guess is, I don't know for sure, and if the brand says there's real Mysore sandalwood in there, go with it, okay? But my guess is, is that um, that it's a Mysore sandalwood accord that, that they created um, and they're calling it my source sandalwood note because they say it's an accord that we think smells like it and that's good enough for us. And I hate it when brands do that. Uh, I would much rather them say that it's just sandalwood in that situation. Um, but you know how it goes. It's all about marketing nowadays. Uh, so I did not like that. But the but the base of that my source sandalwood accord and uh, what they call as ambergris. I don't know if it's an ambergris accord or real ambergris and vanilla and amber was very enjoyable. There's a bark accord in here, like a tree bark. 
Uh, there's violet leaf. So yes, it's very floral. Yes, it's slightly sweet, but that creamy floral sweetness I remember really liking. So check out my review. I thought it was uh, well done. Would I buy a bottle and wear it? Hell no, but I enjoyed it. Um, I thought it was very well done. So Le Dauso de Siam number 30. Number 29 is from the House of January Scent Project. And again, there's going to be a lot of samples here. This one, I actually have the ability to show you what the copy looked like. Um, let me put this Ducita sample set away here. Uh, uno momento. See if I can get it back in its box. Go back to your home. Okay. There you go. Get back in there. All right. So, um, January Scent Project at number 29, and this one's called Selpernicu. Now, I love that he does these sort of um, little, like, um, postcards for what the scent is supposed to remind him of. And I remember instantly recognizing in Selpernicu, so this uh, Arabic Middle Eastern style imagery with the crescent moon and the star, and I remember looking at her and saying, it looks like she has cream on her. And this milky, there's a big milky element to um, Selpernicu. And you know what's crazy? As I sprayed these when I reviewed the fragrances like six months ago or something, and I can still smell them on the card. That is some serious power. Um, if you're into Jeremy Fragrance and power, I would urge you to check this brand out. They are strong. Um... So this is a spicy, fruity fragrance with butter, milk, uh, chamomile, you get the idea, soft, relaxing, gentle, creamy gourmand. And most gourmands I hate, but he did his fragrances in such a unique way. And the imagery is so distinct. I remember telling him in our live stream that we did together, the interview, that um, in, in the Middle East, I was actually born in Jordan. And uh, my mother picked up a lot of tricks from my dad's sisters, and they used to put yogurt on their face and hands and stuff like that to keep their skin soft. It was like a, it was like a tradition. My mom would uh, every every Saturday morning when I was a kid, when I would wake up, I was always make a joke because she'd be down there making breakfast. I'd walk in and go ah, she'd have yogurt like a yogurt mask on uh, to keep her skin uh, smooth. And um, I remember pointing that out to him and he thought that was extremely fascinating because there's definitely something very milky to this. Uh, and it's mixed with things like Immortelle and tobacco, which give that dry, crinkly, hay-like feeling. So that strange contrast between spices and woods and milky fruits and um, very interesting, very different. Even though it's not, you know, something that I would, um, I don't think this is the kind of thing that would really reach out and grab me the um to go buy a bottle exploring it and getting to know it was a total unique experience never smelled anything like these january scent projects they are completely unique um and so if you're somebody who is like man i'm tired of smelling the same old same old over and over and over again i want to smell something different check some of these brands out like january scent project so so selpernicu comes in at number 29 number 28 is um a fragrance that I really enjoy because I really enjoy the Dior Homme DNA in general. And it's funny, someone, I think it was the Devil Man, he said that um, the uh, Prada company just in general decided in 2005 when Dior Homme, when Dior Homme came out, they were like, screw it, we're just going to make all of our fragrances smell like Dior Homme. And as kind of some truth to that, I know he was joking, I think he was joking, but um, this one's called Prada Lome Intense. And this is a flanker from the original Prada Lome, which I think came out a year before this, which I don't own. Uh, although I would not mind owning Prada Lome. And there's also a flanker, I think, called Prada Lome Low, which I'm very interested in exploring one day. But this is this Dior Homme DNA, and it's very well done. But there's supposed to be a little bit more patchouli in here. So there's more heft. You know, it's supposed to be slightly leathery, but it still has that um, iris, makeup-y iris thing that made Dior Homme what it is very um, modern masculine, right? So um, if you're someone who is always interested in staying current, if you don't want to be the guy who wears anything, let's say vintage or out of style, uh, which I can't imagine trying to keep up with all the styles, like how exhausting must that be? But this is definitely, definitely into that modern masculine, metrosexual masculine side of things. Um, I love the way that the iris and that nutty 
Tonka kind of comes together. So nutty Tonka, um, iris, slightly creamy, but heavier, darker patchouli and amber underneath. I think that's what makes this so different. Maybe a little bit of lavender, um, but very modern masculine and very well done. Very, very chic, very posh. Um, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of Prada Loam Intense. Uh, and, and there were rumors there that it was going to get discontinued for a while. I think those have pretty much died away. And, and the rumor is now that it is going to stay. Prada Loam Intense is not in risk of being uh, discontinued. But a lot of folks thought for a while there that it was going to be. So Prada Loam Intense from 2017 at number 28. Number 27 is a Bagwe fragrance. And this is called Mem. So I've struggled with these house, the House of Bagway, I won't lie, uh, but they are slowly climbing my chart. And I'll tell you what, the last time I had a chance to test my, I loved it the most I've ever loved it, um, which is saying something. So they are slowly, slowly climbing the charts. Mem is interesting because Mem is the one that is supposed to be more masculine. There's supposed to be like a lot of uh, different types of lavenders in here. Yeah, and, and again, maybe it's because I'm smelling them on paper and not my skin. Maybe my skin, it's a little harder to wear as a scent of the day. But on the paper, uh, this is the best. I think this is the best Mem has ever smelled to me. It smells amazing right now. So these Bogway houses are, it's moving up the list. Maybe I need to review these soon. Um, so Mem is an animalic floral, okay? from 2017, created by Antonio Gardoni. I don't know why I keep saying 2017. All the damn fragrances in the video are from 2017, but it's very resinous and floral and animalic. Um, lots of castorium and civet, and I think that's what I really like about, um, I really like animalic fragrances, and I like things that grab me, but for some reason, whenever I smelled his fragrances originally, there was something about both of them that put me off, Mem and Mai, that put me off. And it's taken me a long time to kind of come around. In fact, I was so put off that I just wouldn't spray him for the longest time because I was like, my God, you know, it was like, and I think it was like there was this white champaca, jasmine, musk thing that was mixing with um, the animalics in a way that just really put me off. But now... I'm smelling it going, okay, this is, this is right up my alley. Um, and I think what it was, was smelling T-Rex for the, for the first time and getting to know his work, which I'm going to review very soon, God willing, um, because T-Rex deserves a full review. It is a fantastic fragrance, really got me, I think, to understand Antonio Gardoni's style and then coming back to his house of Bog Bogway, um, which is how you're supposed to pronounce it. It's not Bogue. Bogway, um, I much more appreciate these releases now. But yeah, I think at first these are going to be really challenging. Even to me, I was just, you know, um, I was ready to sell them, to be honest with you. But uh, I have, I've come around. I've seen the light. So Mem works its way up to number 27 on the list. Number 26 is a Killian. And it is a stupid Killian with a stupid key in the stupid box, although it is discontinued, so I'm sure this goes for silly money now. Uh, this is called Straight to Heaven Extreme. So 10 years after Straight to Heaven came out, they released Straight to Heaven Extreme with a key that you can literally lock the box just in case someone's trying to steal your perfume or they can't get to it now because you've locked the box with your special you know, one penny plastic key. It's so just, uh, so luxurious, Killian. And then you can unlock your box. Ooh, wow. Uh, but Straight to Heaven Extreme is um, supposed to be an extreme version of Straight to Heaven. I know, I know, but it's true. Uh, and so Straight to Heaven Extreme is uh, patchouli, lots of patchouli, rum, absolute, Bourbon, vanilla, vanilla, cedarwood, amber, and nutmeg. And um, I, I soured on this a little bit when I found a fragrance that smelled very, very similar to my nose for under a hundred bucks. Um, and I'll talk about that one day on the channel as well. But I must admit, I like this. I hate to say I like it, but I do like it. Um, 
so yes, I'll review this one of these days. Uh, Sid Sidone Lancessor. Oh, fuck. I'm hopeless when it comes to names, but she's the perfumer. Um, Sid Lancessor. All the Frenchmen are like, ah, just gouge my ears out now. So um, Straight to Heaven Extreme at number uh, 26. Number 25 is a Javoy fragrance. And pretty soon, I know I keep promising Javoy reviews. But I promise I will be doing some Javoy reviews very soon because this house deserves it. I think uh, as, far as, niche, as far as niche houses go, if you're someone who really wants to explore perfume and you don't just want to flex on folks, you don't want to show off the Swarovski crystals on your bottles and all that shit, right? You want to just really go for well-made, proper niche perfume. This is a house that I can definitely recommend. Uh, and I love the just... Um, what would you say? This uh, very utilitarian approach to the box. You can just throw the box in your bag and go. And I must admit, I uh, respect that a lot. They sit in here like so. And this is Incident Diplomatique at number 25. A fantastic vetiver. So the, so the uh, story on Incident Diplomatique is that uh, apparently the rumor is, is that while testing this fragrance, they went to the airport. And a diplomat smelled it on the person wearing it and made an incident, a diplomatic incident over the perfume. And so hence the name Diplo Incident Diplomatique. Um, oh yeah, so it starts off with this very nutty, earthy um, vetiver. Haitian vetiver and Java vetiver. Slightly smoky, the nutmeg... Oh, the nutmeg is beautiful, so... I love nutmeg in a perfume, especially when it's done right, and it just adds this very masculine, spicy. Um, nutmeg plays referee, and it keeps everything in the bounds. There's a beautiful uh, mandarin orange note in the top, and that mandarin orange note just adds a little bit of spiciness to an otherwise very dark, and, and well, not super dark, because the orange and I think the nutmeg actually brightens the fragrance up. Okay, that's my take on it. So the nutmeg brightens this fragrance up along with the mandarin orange, and it sits on a base of Australian sandalwood and patchouli. And so the smoky, earthier elements of patchouli come out. The, the vetiver is very traditionally masculine and dry, rooty vetiver. Maybe little chocolatey touches from the patchouli here and there. Nowhere near as chocolatey as psychedelic, but uh, still little hints, hints of chocolate, chocolatey patchouli. But the vetiver patchouli combo is just stunning. Very traditionally masculine, spicy, woody. Um, the woody elements of the Australian sandalwood will come through. But I don't think it's going to smell like pickles. It's not going to smell like pickle or anything like that. Um, Vanina Murak. Moraciole, Moraciole, or Moracoil, hell, I don't know, uh, let's go with Moraciole, Moraciole, uh, but Vanina made this, and whoever she is, uh, um, she has actually done some stuff for Mass Milano, Kinsuki, Kinsugi, interesting, that's on my wish list, I've never smelled that one. Um, and she's done some stuff for Jeroboam, which is my secret, um, one of the brand that makes the fragrance that is my secret, uh, weapon for the, uh, Straight to Heaven Extreme replacement. And she did another Javoy called Fire at Will, which I have never smelled, but has been on my wish list for a while. Interesting. Very interesting. I uh, love Incident Diplomatique, though. Absolutely adore it. I think it's fantastic. And I think the House of Javoy is a fantastic house. They're brilliant. Uh, everything is quality, but you don't pay a ton of money for them. Okay. Next on the list, we have... At number 24, Smolder Rose. So we're back to January Scent Project. I have a full review of um, Smolder Rose on the channel or else it would not be in this list because it's only a sample. I do not own a bottle. But Smolder Rose's artwork looks like this. There's a Denudist, Bervuvu, Horla, Eider Antler. Oh, no. Uh, here it is, yes. Smolder Rose. How's that? Look at that. That is a fantastic outline. Go watch my review of uh, Smolder Rose if you want to see about all the little details in this 
picture come to life. Uh, it almost looks like there's a vine wrapping around his arm, her, his or her arm, if you pay attention. And yet she's still going for the, uh, for the smolder rose. Um, and I, uh, I actually remember really, I'm not going to be able to find it now, but, um, I remember really being taken with this. This is maybe one of my favorite, uh, January scent project scents. The way that the rose mixes with the, there's an oud note in here, um, and some saffron, oud saffron frankincense, and there's a choya naka note, which I can't remember exactly, uh, what that is. I think it has something to do with seashells, toast, like toasted seashells or, or, um, yeah, I think it is toasted sea seashells. There's some elderflower, very interesting smells in January scent projects. That's the thing. You won't smell, um, you won't smell fragrances. I swear to God, I can still smell the base of this fragrance six months later. I promise to, it's the craziest thing. It's the absolute craziest thing. Um, you will not smell, uh, fragrance compositions that smell like these at all. I've never smelled any that smell like these. They smell completely unique and different. Um, very interesting scent. I really enjoyed Smolder Rose like that. Uh, literally a smoldering rose, but there were sort of um, aspects, other aspects to that play a big role in this as well. So go check out my review if you want to learn more. Smolder Rose at number 24. Number 23 is another, there's a lot of samples in here. I'm telling you, I'm shooting myself in the foot doing it this way. Um, St. Giles has a fragrance called The Mechanic, which I absolutely loved. It was a Bertrand Ducha for it, number 23. Um, and The Mechanic is spicy, leathery, 100% my kind of fragrance. Patchouli, castorium, there was this rubber accord. I mean, it was literally supposed to be a mechanic. The uh, picture I put up was the uh, advertisement of kind of the red sports car, the mechanic on the top, St. Giles on the bottom, um, and the trees just kind of f flowing by in the background because, of course, the sports car is zooming, um, and it is just a brilliant fragrance. Made me want to smell more from the house, let's put it that way. So others from the house of St. Giles are on the list. Uh, I would love to smell things like the musician, the stylist, the writer, the tycoon, um, even the actress, which is, which is marketed towards women. I'd love to smell them all. The, uh, mechanic was so good that it made me want to smell more from the brand. So number 23, the mechanic. Number 22, we have our, it, our first Prin fragrance. And this one's called Mogao. Mogao. M-O-G-A-O. And Mogao was very interesting because go watch my review. Basically, I remember the spicy, fiery Sichuan pepper. And I remember, uh, this image of being in a cave and there was a lot of imagery of sort of covered uh, sittings where people are sitting around fires and sharing ideas uh, and there was a lapsang souchong tea note which uh, is kind of like a burnt it was like a burnt tea smell and I think the original smugglers of laps the, the way that tea caught on it's a very interesting podcast about the history of tea and sort of history being linked together and one of the stories that was told on the podcast where the people smuggling tea, this particular type of tea, uh, were going to get caught. So they panicked, they buried the, the tea, and then they set it on fire so they didn't get caught. Uh, and then they came back because they realized, oh shit, our boss is going to kill us because we just wasted this shipment. So they were like, let's sell it to the, whoever was buying it, probably the English. They're, they're the tea buyers of the day. Uh, and they sold it, assuming that they would never be... Uh, talking to those people again because they screwed them over and the people were basically beating their door down saying we want more Lapsong Suchong tea. They love the smoky earthy elements because they buried it and then burned it. Um, and so that's a rumor of the way that that tea was started. But just imagine people sitting around, a uh, slight animalic touch from the Costas, uh, but overall the animalics were not too bad in this one. I know there were some print fragrances that just felt like he was just throwing the most ridiculous animalic stuff at you where it's just like, okay, this smells like cat turds put in a pot and you're going to cook it and then you're going to serve it. There's your cat turd stew. And people are like, brilliant. Oh, it's just a masterpiece. Yes, I absolutely love that print. Oh, you're just a genius. Uh, and some of the stuff I was smelling from him, I'm like, what in the world is this? Uh, and I think he tried to use shock factor as um, just a replacement for what I would consider good perfume. You know, a shock factor in the opening, 
uh, good fragrances should shock you, but there should be more to it that oh, that continues to go on. And with in 2017, I think he had his best year as a perfumer, in my opinion, uh, because Mogao came out, which is very good, but also one is my my absolute all time favorite print came out in 2017. So what he was doing in 2017 was good stuff. And when he tries to get away from that shock factor and he tries to build an actual fragrance, this had cinnamon, champaca. The champaca was um, beautiful in here. Orange flower, osmanthus, which also you can have osmanthus tea, so it adds in with the lapsong, souchong tea, and the people sitting around, and the leathery, nectarine aspects of it, and kumquat, and cumin, and plum, and resins, and leather, and frankincense. Very complex scent was uh, mogao, but I really enjoyed it. So go check out my review if you want to learn more about that smoky, spicy bomb. Unfortunately, discontinued, but um, uh, really interesting print fragrance at number 22. Number 21, one of the best zoologists, in my opinion, and this is Camel. So this is actually a vintage bottle of Camel. You can tell because there's no zoologist crest on the top of this bottle, and there's no sticker on the bottom or on the cap. Um, so Camel is a zoologist release from 2020 from <laughs> let's try this again a zoologist release from 2017 god knows why i keep repeating that like i have a tick or something it is a zoologist release from 2017 and um it is basically a spicy oriental fragrance if you will done in a style that has this beautiful dried fruit accord so it's dry think dried fruits and think um, think along with those dried fruits, Middle Eastern style, like dates and incense materials. It's interesting they say incense material instead of just frankincense. So some sort of incense material, whatever that is. Uh, myrrh. There's also frankincense. Rose. Cinnamon. Orange blossom. Amber. Cedar. Jasmine. Civet. So there's a little bit of a funk in here, just a bit. Musk, sandalwood, vanilla, oud, tonka bean, and vetiver. But I love the way the dried fruits give you that, um, you know, like you're in a desert and there's no real fruit to eat. So you're going to eat dried fruits because you're carrying it on your expedition and you're smelling the incense material as you pass different villages, sleeping villages with beautiful rows in the gardens and those dates growing on, on trees. So you stop and you pick fresh dates and, oh, it's just fantastic. Just brilliant, brilliant fragrance from the House of Zoologists. This is done by Christian Carbonell, AKA Chris Maurice, um, who's a very good perfumer. So, uh, Camel comes in at number 21. Number 20, we are going to Fort and Manly. And um, this is a sample, I believe Nick sent me a lot of these samples we're discussing in this fragrance uh, this year in perfume. But um, this one's called Suleiman the Magnificent, or Suleiman le Magnifique. Le Magnifique. Um, and so Fort and Manly has discontinued a bunch of their fragrances. Unfortunately, I didn't get to smell um, a lot of the things from the house yet. There's still a bunch I'd like to smell. Never smelled all the Queen's Men, um, 40 Thieves, uh, Late Harvest, Oneria. Impressions de Giverny, uh, Mer Marikai, Maduro, V for Vetiver, Under Which Rivers Flow. You get the idea. There's a lot from the brand that I have not smelled. Uh, but this one, Suleiman Le Mag the Magnificent, is unfortunately discontinued for whatever reason. Uh, and if you watch my review, it's a very spicy oriental fragrance with his patented red apple, which he loved using. Ross Ross I Fort loved using that red apple note. Uh, and it's here along with a patchouli benzoin combination. But what made this one stand out is there was this oud accord, which is not listed. There's no oud listed, but you definitely get a little bit of that oud accord and this beautiful Turkish galbanum. And if you know anything about Suleiman the Magnificent, he was a ruler of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and so Turkish galbanum is uh, very heavily sought after. And the Turkish galbanum is beautiful in here. The green with the red rose and apple and just fantastic fragrance. Very ambery, spicy, oriental. Um, go watch my review if you want more of the details. But I, I would definitely own a bottle of this if money was no issue. Very good stuff at number uh, 20. Number 19. Number 19 is a Beaufort fragrance. Absolute insanity, this fragrance. But if you're into crazy fragrances, this is a must-sniff. This is called Iron Duke. 
And first of all, what a name, beautiful packaging, other than the fact that the uh, black part's kind of coming off, you can see it up here, but, um, and it, you, know, you can really see it here where it's ripped. But um, the fragrance is fantastic by the House of Beaufort. They are, you know, think about what Amouage was doing back in the day. And just imagine amplifying that to the nth degree of zero fucks given, okay? Beaufort is the zero fucks given house. And actually, this fragrance is one of the reasons why I don't own Royal uh, Royal Tobacco. Because this fragrance does what Royal Tobacco does for me. It's not a one-to-one -one comparison, because this goes in a little different direction, but it definitely gives me Royal Tobacco vibes by Amouage. Um... But Iron Duke is very leathery, very spicy. I mean, just imagine you're in a war, okay? And imagine you're in a tank. And the guy next to you is so scared he's going to die. He's just sitting there drinking some sort of alcohol, liquor. And um, you can smell the metallic burnt parts of old husks of tanks as you stroll by. You can smell the inside of your tank, the, the paint peeling. There's a Cambodian oud note, which is very earthy. And um, there's tobacco, because the guy next to you is also chain-smoking because he thinks he's going to die. Star anise and leather. There's soap, all right? But it almost smells like you're smelling like um, like you're getting a whiff of, of a bar of soap randomly sitting in the tank next to you. And there's charred woods, so you get like, you know, this charred accord, almost like you're almost like a shell landed in the forest and set off a fire. And as you're driving by, you get this charred black smoke remains. There's gunpowder. There's bourbon whiskey. All right. So the guy first started with maybe some Grand Marnier or something. And he's like, screw it. I'm pulling out the heavy stuff and just starts chugging it. There's hay and musk and just an insane fragrance. You would think this would be nuts, that everyone would hate this. And yet it works so well. Um, literally, the reason I did not buy... Royal Tobacco was because of this. I'd love a bottle of Royal Tobacco, but now that I have to be frugal with my spending because of the divorce, um, unfortunately, buying Royal Tobacco is no longer in the cards, but um, Iron Duke fills that uh, void. So fantastic stuff by the House of Beaufort. Bravo. From Julie Dunkley, a uh, brave, brave woman creating these fragrances. Very, very impressed. Uh, Iron Duke is a tribute to Arthur Wellesley, Duke of Wellington, 1769 to 1852. Oh, it's an English brand, by the way. So all of their fragrances are uh, modeled after English history. The campaign was photographed by Matthew Seeds. Very, very impressive. Um, okay, so that was number 19. Number 18 is a Roja, and it is a discontinued Roja. Many of these Middle Eastern fragrances uh, from his Middle Eastern line are sadly discontinued, and this is one such fragrance. This is called the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And um, you can see I've, I've given this a good amount of wares. I have a full review on the channel. Uh, and it is a very interesting oriental, fruity. So you get things like raspberry, blackcurrant, apple, banana, strawberry. No clue where any of these comes from. Plum. I don't understand what that has to do with Saudi Arabia. But it's mixed with artemisia and aldehydes, oud, cotton candy, leather, saffron, cacao. Um, violet leaf, a very fruity um, take on an oriental style, perfect for the hot weather. Like if you were like Ramsey, what's an oriental fragrance to wear in the heat? Saudi Arabia comes to mind instantly. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia by uh, Roja Dove. Go check out my uh, full review if you're interested in learning more. Okay, next on the list, we have our very first Arige Le Doré at number 17. So at number 17, we have our first, but definitely not our last, Aries La Doré. And this is called um, Fleu de Fleur. So this is called Fleu de Fleur. And I have a review of Fleu de Fleur that literally no one watched. Um, like two people watched this review. And I get it. I mean, it's a fragrance that you're never going to smell probably because they're impossible to find. Um... But I, um, as, as you would think, all of my Arizadores are right to the top, and they pretty much are. This one is a little challenging uh, because Fleur de Flora was a huge floral composition, so you get a ton of things like Frangipani, which gives that tropical vibe, Jasmine Sambach, which is kind of the more masculine Jasmine. It's not the deep, old-school grandma Jasmine, as people say, 
and tuberose absolute, which is very tough, I would say, in a cord. And it's mixed with things like coconut water, okay? So you get white florals and coconut and honeysuckle and blue lotus absolute uh, and henna um, and a bunch of frankincense in the top with um, different types of oud, or I'm sorry, yeah, there is a Cambodian oud, Siberian deer musk, and castorium. The um, ingredients in this are top notch. Getting to smell like the real jasmine and, you know, real frangipani, real tuberose absolute is an absolute treat. Um, there's no doubt about it, but it comes across as very sweet. And that's the part of flu de floor that I struggle with. Um, I think there's real Siberian deer musk in here. There's real castorium. Um, it is something that I think it would have to, uh, this is one of those fragrances where you're just so happy to get to smell it because you smell all these amazing like blue lotus absolute is such a rare ingredient because of the I think very low yield of uh of when they uh distill it but I think it's expensive to use so you get all these beautiful flowers it's not my favorite type of uh a Riz la Dore. you're going to see those as we get closer to the top but um this is just a fantastic fragrance for what it is if you're a floral lover this is one that smells like no other floral fragrance I've ever smelled because of the combination. It's not just a rose, lily of the valley, jasmine, you know, the usual stuff you've smelled a million times. This adds so many different elements with the Sumatra oud, Cambodian oud, castorium, tolu balsam, um, all of these different real Siberian deer musk, and then the frankincense. So, yes, I have a full review. Go check it out. But I must warn you, this is a strange one. Very strange, Arish Ladore, but I enjoy it. Um, at number 17. Number 16 is a, a sample, which I could not find, but it's here somewhere. It is uh, Francesca Bianchi's Under My Skin, which I really, really enjoyed. Uh, Robes08 just did an unboxing of Under My Skin, I think, within the last day or two. So you can go check out his thoughts as well. Spicy, animalic, very skin-like, okay? There's something absolutely skin-like about Under My Skin. It has a real human skin aspect with her sort of leather or butter. I think it's one of her best fragrances, hands down. Um, if I could sort of uh, trade my bottle of, um, of uh, what was the Francesca Bianchi that I bought that I was very, not disappointed, Etruscan water. If I could trade my bottle of Etruscan water for under my skin, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Um, however, the thing about under my skin is to me, there are definite similarities between this little bad boy, which I have reviewed on the channel. This is Bala Versailles, and I think Bala Versailles wins 10 out of 10 times against Under My Skin. Under My Skin is a very good replacement if you can't find a, a vintage bottle of, of Bala Versailles because it's discontinued and hard to find and all that stuff. But, um, um, you know, since I have a bottle of Bala Versailles, I wouldn't go out and run and buy a bottle of Under My Skin, but it's very, very good, very well done. Um, most, I've been very hard on some of her work. That is one that deserves her flower. She deserves her flowers for that one. Um, Francesca Bianchi's Under My Skin, number 16. Number 15 is a Guerlain, and it is actually a discontinued Guerlain, even in its current form. They changed the name. So they changed the name, uh, in 2021. Originally, when it came out in 2017, it looked like this, in this leather bound box, which I actually really enjoyed, really like, and it was called Louis. And uh, Louis is an amazing carnation fragrance, just absolutely stunning. It only came in these 50 mils, which um, put some people off, but um, I really enjoyed. It's like, a, it's like a clove, it's like a huge clove carnation fragrance with that, um, with that Guerlain sort of um, benzoiny uh, vanillic dry down and it is I think very very good um, Delphine Jelk is credited as the perfumer here not Thierry Vasser yes I mean this is Guerlain through and through this is um, this has definitely that Guerlain DNA slightly leathery man but that spicy carnation note is brilliant in here 
Not as well done as the, not as amazing as the real Carnation Absolute, which I've smelled, which is so much greener and um, denser and thicker, but this is still very, very good. For Guerlain, for, for a brand owned by, by LVMH, this is very, very good. Um, so that is Guerlain's Louis Discontinued. They put it in their new bottle from the, um, this, uh, La Art and La Matier collection that they are overcharging people for in 2021. And then I believe they completely discontinued it uh, just last year, if I'm not mistaken. So yes, uh, Louis by Guerlain at number uh, 15. Number 14 is a creed. And I don't care what you guys say. I love this stuff. Um, and I think that the Cologne version, which came out, I believe, in a couple years ago in 21, is shite, all right? So Viking Cologne sucks ass to me. Uh, but this version, the original Viking from 2017, I absolutely love this stuff. Love it. And um, I love applying this with reckless abandon on a warm day. There is something so uplifting about Viking. It's spicy. It's fresh. It's got this uh, very zesty peppermint Um that just, I mean, it's it's literally like a pick-me-up when you spray it. It's like how you would expect a cologne to make you feel, but many colognes don't make me feel like that. They don't feel like they have that energy, that energy. Um, and they disappear way too fast. This lasts on my skin. There's a lot to smell. There's a lot of transitions. Um, this Bulgarian rose note creeps in like it's actually sitting on a pirate ship. Uh, you know, or on a Viking ship coming coming into bay. There's this spicy clove, and the lavender in here is brilliant. Uh, lavendin or lavender, I don't know what they're, probably lavendin, because there's something a little harsher about it. There's almost, um, it's a little bit scratchy, but I, I don't mind that. I like that. And the, the woody, musky dry down is so creed. I mean, it just has that, you know, very fresh, citrusy, energetic opening. And I love the pink pepper, um, normally pink pepper is a very boring designer like smell, you know, slightly rosy, peppery, but here they've, they've used so much zing and it's, and it's supposedly mixed with absinthe. I don't know. I don't get very much of a boozy accord, but maybe a little bit of a greenness here and there. Um, but it's just, I mean, for me, you can see I got the 500 mil bottle, uh, because I never want to be without this. I absolutely love Viking. And, um, I, I, I actually... I wish I would have kept the bottle, but I ran through an entire hundred mil and like an idiot, I threw the bottle out. This is before I had a channel. Literally when this first came out in 2017, I bought a bottle brand new, a uh, hundred mils. Uh, and it was one of the new bottles and, and, um, the new hundred mil bottles. This was the first creed to go into the new hundred mil bottles. So, uh, I bought it blind. Okay. Cause remember this was right after, uh, this was the first masculine since Aventus is how they kind of, uh, um, how they marketed this. And a lot of people shit all over it online and all the people that had, um, you know, channels shit all over this fragrance, which was fine. Cause I was able to then buy a 500 mil when I, uh, sold my, uh, when I, when I completely used up my bottle and chunked it, uh, and I was able to get this for, very close to what I, for what a new 100 mil goes for now. I was able to get 500 mils for almost what 100 mils goes for. So, um, so yes, I'm a huge Viking fan, if you can't tell. Uh, but I did run through an entire bottle. So I've used the shit out of Viking since 2017. Uh, I've heard it referred to as a modern take on a fougere. That's an interesting take. I mean, that'll get you in the ballpark because of the lavender and tonka. I could totally see like a modern take on a fougere. Yes, absolutely. Beautiful stuff though by uh, by Creed. Very, very well done. Uh, and I'll review it one of these days. So Viking at number 14. Number 13 is a Tom Ford and a fantastic Tom Ford and a discontinued Tom Ford. Hurts my heart. Although people knew this was going to get discontinued. They were calling for this discontinuation as soon as they smelled it. And they were like, oh, this is going to get discontinued. This is Tom Ford's Noir Anthracite. Thank God I have 100 mils of this stuff uh, because I think this is fantastic. Think, oh yes. So think Narciso Rodriguez um, for him, EDT. My brother Rich Mitch from across the pond just reviewed that bad boy. So Noir Anthracite. Okay, so Anthracite. Um, 
uses a brilliant Sichuan pepper note. Think about the red in Journeyman. The opening of this is that color in my mind, not this drab gray. That comes later. The opening is this brilliant red from the Sichuan pepper, fiery. And, um, oh, it's fantastic. Uh, I, I love under my uh, Noir Anthracite. It is um, the... Um, the contrast between that fiery red and the green galbanum with the macassar woods and this very concrete like patchouli smell. It almost smells like the road is paved with patchouli, uh, very deep and dark. And lots of different woods, Salinese sandalwood, cedar wood, uh, and there's a brilliant use of tuberose in here. So there are some fragrances that have, have uh, used tuberose in a way that I can stand. Some of the tuberose fragrances really put me off. I don't care so much for the mentholated tuberose-like smell. Um, but there have been some masculine fragrances lately that have tuberose in them. And this is one that I've come to discover that I absolutely love. Um, there, is a, um, there is a fragrance from the house of uh, Les Abstraits called Desandras which has a brilliant tuberose note in here by Antoine Lee. So tuberose fragrances, tuberose in masculine fragrances is if used properly, I think it just adds this extra level, you know, like it, um, it takes it to the next level because so few masculine fragrances have this proper tuberose note in here. Oh, it's just fantastic. I am, uh, I'm in love with Noir Anthracite. And I'll review that one of these days at number 13. Number 12 is an amouage. And it is an amouage that is on the to review list. Um, and I think this is probably one of the most challenging amouages. This is called Figment Man. Um, Figment Man is a creation by the great um, Anique Minardo. All right. Um, and... So Figment Man is probably one of the most challenging amouages um, because Figment Man to me literally smells like you're smelling, you know, an old school. Imagine that you took Koros, all right, and you buried it next to the creek. And as you buried it, you're digging into soil that's just so hard, it's almost like clay, all right? You're digging and, and your shovel literally hits an earthworm. You pull the earthworm out of the ground. You cut him in half. He's still wiggling. You throw him away, and you smell your hand, all right? You're wearing Koros. You put your hand in the ground. You pull out the earthworm. You smell your hand. There's that weird, weird, earthy feel that just under the ground gives almost a haunting feel, you know? Like you're thinking, God, I'm going to be under there one day because uh, I'll be dead, and I'll be buried in there with the worms. And uh, one day... The worm is what will be crawling over me. I won't be grabbing the worm. The worm will almost be grabbing me. There's this weird earthy bit to it with Koros, with this Koros civet, synthetic civet thing. Um, geranium. And it's very strange. I think it's probably the hardest, I think it's probably the most challenging amouage. In fact, most amouages I blind bought, when I heard about this, Someone was like, dude, don't blind buy this. Um, and, and I remember as soon as this came out, they were like, don't blind buy it. Test it first. I'm telling you, rumor is this is going to be very, very challenging. And I'm like, I love challenging amouages. And I'm rah, rah, I'm definitely going to buy it. I don't need to sample it. And they were like, sample it. Trust me. So I got a sample and I was like, hell no, I'm not buying this. This is crazy. This is the craziest amouage of all time. And I didn't buy it for the longest time until like a year or two ago. Um when I corrected that wrong, because I realized, man, they're going to discontinue this. And as I have worn it more and more, I've come to appreciate the genius of it. And in fact, I think this is uh, Anique Minardo's greatest creation that no one talks about. Uh, obviously, she's well known for her designer stuff, but this is one of the most artistic fragrances she's ever created. And if you love vintage fragrances, um, Figment Man is a must sniff. If you're a Koros lover, Figment Man is a must sniff. Uh, okay, so that was number 12. Number 11 is my favorite Prin fragrance of all time, uh, and it's called Mora, M-O-R-A-H. His, his naming is really hard sometimes, I think, to distinguish, but Mora, I think, is a masterpiece, okay? And there's a lot of people who told me, 
Um, stick with it, Ramsey. Stay with Pran. You'll find something you like. I promise he does all these different types of fragrances. You just were getting some of the really challenging ones at first. Mora, I think, is like a brilliant Sheepra. There's all these insane uh, notes in here. Like there's Cannonball Tree Blossom, which is an actual thing. You got to look it up. Apparently, they're huge. Um, there's Opium in here. Uh, and But not Opium like Opium the Fragrance that's sitting right here. But there is an actual like Opium note in here. There's Tobacco. There's Champaca Flower. There's Coffee Absolute. So there's a little bit of this um, sort of imagine like coffee that's went through a civet's gut and shit out. Right, that that Kopi Luwak like feel. Um, there's a little bit of this animalic coffee, but in a sheepra construction. So if you know your um, modern sheepras and you've ever smelled zoologist civet, you're in the ballpark. But imagine zoologist civet done by an artisanal house like Prin, where you get weird things thrown in here. There's an ash tree note. There's teak, teak wood, frangipani, Indian tuberose, cumin. Lots of very interesting cumin and aldehydes and oak moss and gardenia. So you get the idea of this crazy fragrance that should not work, but it does. It works brilliantly. I love Mora. If you said, Ramsey, you get to pick one print fragrance right now, Mora, instantly. Uh, the second one, which I really fell in love with, was that very weird, um, it was a, uh, it was a print fragrance that had a very weird uh, oud note. And it was a Thai oud that almost smelled like a rubber balloon. Or like a like a camping, uh, like one of those blow up beds that you left the air in too long. And when you let the air out, it feels like you're also smelling the plastic that it was up against for the last six months before you forgot to let the air out. Right? Had this stale internal rubbery balloon, stretchy bounce house like smell. That that was another print that I thought was very interesting. But I think that was just more the oud he was using. This is more his actual ability to create a fragrance. So very impressed with Mora uh, at number 11. Number 10 is an Amouage and it is Beach Hut Man. So Beach Hut Man is sadly, sadly, sadly discontinued. Um, well, they say, uh, Parfumo says it's still being marketed, but I, I hear this entire line is discontinued. This whole midnight flower collection or whatever they call it. Um, I hear that they're potentially cutting this whole line, which is very sad um, because I think Beach Hut is an amazing creation. It's um, one of my favorite modern green fragrances. So if you're like Ramsey, I, I'm in love with green fragrances. Tell me something that's unique, Beach Hut Man. Beach Hut Man, the best way to describe it is it is not necessarily uh, a hut on a beach but it is a beach hut that has been like helicoptered to the middle of the Vietnam jungle and placed dead smack in the middle of the jungle. So you get things like ivy, mint, vetiver, mosses, patchouli, galbanum. It's green. It's fresh, but it's almost like this enclosed jungle. Imagine humans no longer live on earth and the earth is like, you know, healing itself from all the shit we did to it, okay? So all of the cities and buildings have vines growing all over it like the last of us, right? But this is in the middle of a jungle. And underneath emerges this very, like, uh, resinous myrrh, okay? Absolutely stunning fragrance. One of the strongest fragrances in my collection. And I love wearing this in the uh, spring and summer because of the green touches in here. It is... It is absolutely fantastic, all right? Just a, a green, this is the Hulk. I mean, this is a green monster of a, of a scent. Uh, if Interlude is the blue beast, this is the green beast, all right? In my opinion, I love Beach Hut Man. And I reviewed uh, Enclave on the channel. Enclave is the mint that is put up with a bunch of Amber Extreme and all this other modern Amber Woods. This is the mint that I would say is for me. Beach Hut Man is... I love that green freshness. Fantastic. If you've never smelled it, I would highly encourage you to. So at number 10, Beach Hut. Number nine, one of the greatest designers of the decade, period, full stop. I reviewed it on the channel. Apparently, someone told me that there are differences between your bottle of Gucci Guilty Absolute if it's made in the UK or made in Spain. So I don't know if they restarted operations and started making these in the UK, but there are rumors of 
UK made in the UK bottles floating around that smell different. I have no idea. Uh, I think mine was made in Spain, which I double checked. Yes, it is. Um, yes, made in Spain. So I don't know what's going on with that, but I can tell you Gucci Guilty Absolute is one of the greatest designers of the of the decade. Okay. Um, and go watch my full review if you want kind of more detailed information on it. But there's a wood leather note in here, which you're going to be shocked, but it smells like wood and leather. Uh, and there's a golden wood note in here. Um, and there's a Nootka Cypress note. And there's patchouli and vetiver. And some people say this smells like Band-Aids. Some people say this smells like hospital cleaner. Some people say that... Um, you know, it smells like you took that Band-Aid and hospital cleaners and then set them all on fire in a campfire because you lost your mind. It is, um, it is just one of the most unique. Into, and the fact that Gucci put this in the Gucci Guilty bottle is just mind-blowing. But uh, but they did. And, it, and, and, you know, when you type in Gucci Guilty into Parfumo, first thing that comes up is Gucci Guilty Absolute. That's what people are looking for. They're not looking for Gucci Guilty. Gucci Guilty line is trash. This is the only one worth getting. Um, and I've got a decant of Gucci Guilty Oud. That's actually not that bad. I'll, I'll review it on the channel. Very spicy. Lots of cumin and, and stuff like that. If you liked uh, La Tizan's uh, Al Oud, that may be something to consider. But Gucci Guilty Absolute is um, honestly one of the best designers. So sad it's discontinued. Uh, Parfumo says it was last marketed by Coty, which means it's done. So for all of you who are like, no, it's not discontinued. I think you're just seeing old stock is my guess. So um, Gucci Guilty Absolute number nine. Number eight, we're back to a sample, unfortunately. Uh, but I do have a bottle of this on the way, thanks to Natalia in Poland. It's very, very kind of you. I uh, hope you are well wherever you are, Natalia. Um, and it's called Dryad by Papillon. Papillon is um, what I would consider one of the best artisanal slash niche houses, whatever you want to call it, in the world. Um, and Liz Moores, who has been on the channel, go check out my review with her. She is absolutely fantastic. She has a new fragrance coming out, which I cannot wait to smell. Um, and she agreed to come on again and do a live stream with me one day. So I'm going to hold her to that because uh, the first one went so brilliantly. I loved having her on. The, everyone else loved having her on. So, um, but this one's called Dryad from 2017. It's a green Shepra. So imagine if you took Val de Nui meets, you know, um, like uh, an, an animalic version of number 19 and just merge them together. So there's a bunch of castorium and tobacco and um, uh, civet, all these animalic notes in here in a green Shepra. Amazing stuff. I love Dryad. Cannot wait to have that bottle in my hand. Honestly, every single fragrance she makes is full bottle worthy. Literally every single thing in that line, even Hera, which was made for her daughter's wedding, I would wear. Hera is one of the best um, ambrette. There is this ambrette iris combination in Hera that was just honestly breathtaking. The ambrette in Hera is uh, maybe one of the best, like... Um, if you want to say Ramsey, show me uh, a reference Ambrett fragrance, Hera would probably be what I would show you. It is uh, just fantastic. Her work is out outrageous. And I can't wait to smell her new uh, fragrance in honor of her horse, which passed away. So I know that's going to be emotional, and I know that uh, that's just going to be a brilliant fragrance. Okay, so that's Dryad at number eight. Number seven. We have one of my favorite, this made number one in my Frederick Mall countdown. You can go watch my, um, I call it a family portrait. So go watch my Frederick Mall family portrait. This was number one. This is Promise. And Promise comes in at number seven here. Um, and I'll tell you what, I am in love with Promise. Promise is um, such a huge fragrance. And, you know, you get that um, apple accord, which is so well done. Dominique Ropion created Promise, who he is a master, obviously. One spray is literally all you need. It is so strong, but I love what Promise does. I I know it's kind of the cheaper of the Middle Eastern Frederick Malls, but Promise, God, that apple-rose combination with that, oh, the Cipriol on the base is just to die for. I mean, I just mentioned... Um, uh, that Hera was like a ambrette, 
like reference fragrance, this is a Cipriol reference. If you're like Ramsey, show me one of the best examples of Cipriol in a perfume. Promise. Promise is, oh, fuck, I love it. I love how unapologetically bold it is. Prom Promise just absolutely punches you in the face. And when you look at it for an apology, it just punches you in the other face. I mean, it just slaps both cheeks, right? It's like slap, and then you look at it again, slap the other cheek. Promise is, um, oh man, Promise is, uh, I'm, I'm in love with Promise. I love wearing Promise. I love the, the, um, I love the hugeness of Promise. It's such a huge fragrance. Um, and I'm sure there's a ton of Ambroxan and all this stuff to make it throw and, and all the stuff that it does, but the spicy woody aspects, the castorium, which makes it slightly animalic. And I think obviously the reason that Promise is cheaper is because it doesn't have that quote unquote real oud like um, the Knight, for example. But the problem with the Knight is I don't think the Knight can compete with some of these Ariz Ladores we're going to talk about. And they sold for 25% of the price of the Knight. So I think value for money, Promise is where it's at because you get the experience of a Dominique Ropion and, you know, you get the quality of a Frederick Mall. Um, but you're not paying all this huge upcharge just because there's real oud in it, right? So yes, promise at number seven. Number six. All right, now here we go. It's going to be back to back to back to back to back of Riz Ladores. This is just my taste, all right? This is where I have these. So number six is Atlantic Ambergris. I've got a full review of this. This is a very um, cinnamon and... Um, nutmeg heavy version of an ambergris fragrance very dark lots of um resins apopanax there is nagarmatha in here which is also known as cipriol and violet leaf and cardamom and so there's spices and cloves and that white ambergris accord just a very dark unique spicy take on an ambergris fragrance but uh, very well done atlantic ambergris at, from 2017 at number six number five is uh, Oud Picante, which I have somewhere over there. It's just a tiny little bit that's left. Oud Picante, I absolutely bashed when I first reviewed it. And uh, because I, I only got a chance to wear it once as my scent of the day. And I only have like one spray left that I'm just cherishing. I would love, actually, every single one of these we're about to talk about that I only have the little sample of, I would love a full bottle of. But Oud Picante grew on me like no other. And that's the thing. I remember Russian Adam at the time saying, man, I thought you would have loved that, Ramsey. And um, what's interesting is that stuck with me because I kept coming back to it. And I and I had just enough where I would do just a little spray before bed sometimes of Oud Picante. And I would spray it and wear it. And I'm like, wow, this has continued to grow on me. And I really feel like sometimes it's like the old saying, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Sometimes with these artisanal fragrances, you have to give your nose time to adjust. Many people would not like Oud Picante at first. You can go watch my review of why I didn't care for it as much. Um, the harshness of things like the spike nard, the cumin. Um, there was a Bengali sandalwood, a muhuhu note in there. Um, there's costas, which usually gives off this wet hair, you know, animal hair, even, even human hair like vibe. Um, but as I revisited it, man, Oud Picante, I think is... Uh, just, I don't want to use the word masterpiece, but for my taste, I would love a bottle of Oud Picante at number five. Number four is probably what made Russian Adam's career to begin with. It was Ottoman Empire, which is, um, I mean, what do you say about uh, a fragrance like Ottoman Empire that hasn't been said? Go watch my review. One of the greatest, um, flor floriental fragrances I've ever smelled, like five types of rose, Frangipani water. Um, there's white rose in here as well, which um, there was a uh, fragrance from Sultan Pasha that used this white ro Alba Rose Otto, they, they called it. And that's a white rose Otto that reminded me a little bit of Ottoman Empire with multiple types of oud, Assam oud, Indian oud, um, saffron, myrrh, just all of these amazing ingredients. It just really takes you back. Uh, Ottoman Empire is just an absolute monster uh, classic. They've, they've released probably five or five, I think four or five different versions of Ottoman Empire. And every single time 
he mentions the mysteriousness of it, the extravagant riches of it, um, you know, and he says that everything is exactly the same, that he uses the formula the same every single time. Now, sometimes, let's say, the frangipani flowers from this distillation this year are different from the last one, or the um, oud distillation may be slightly different from this to this, but the formula is, is exactly the same from what Russian Adam has told me. Just a a rose oud combination to end all rose ouds for me. I would love a bottle of Ottoman Empire. Any of them. Any of them. Doesn't matter to me. Just fantastic stuff. I mean, man. And this thing projects and, and wear, lasts all day. It's unbelievable. So, huge fan. Very natural smelling. I know um, that uh, it, can, it can be a very uh, divisive fragrance so be careful with the sprays with some of these but man i love ottoman empire at number four number three is one of my favorite musk fragrances of all time i know there's some folks who keep telling me you have to smell some of ensar's musk but they're so hard to get a hold of but this is siberian musk and look how much juice i have left i've been babying this decant i effing love this stuff uh siberian musk is my god man i mean for me it is uh, what I would consider one of the perfect musk fragrances. Um, like if I was going to create a musk for me, this is the kind of musk that I want to wear because it uses the leathery aspects of the musk. You know, the, like tincturing the skin of the musk pod makes it a little bit more leathery. Uh, it's very pure, wild are words that Russian Adam uses. Uh, exotic Siberian smoky pine and um, fruits, so it's like fruity, musky, but the, macer the maceration comes from that legally obtained wild Siberian deer musk grains, and um, there's sandalwood in here, but nothing, there's green agarwood oil from Papua New Guinea, and you can smell it, blue cypress and the, and the green agarwood oil distillations, you know, it really smells like you're not just smelling the deer musk, you're smelling the entire environment that the deer lives in, along with the musk, the pissy musk that is used to attract a mate and, of course, mark your territory to tell other males that, hey, I am I am a strong, you know, I'm sure they can, when uh, a deer smells uh, another deer's, let's say, musk residue or, or urine, it, it flows into the urine from the way I understand it when they mark their territories, they can probably smell and tell exactly whether it's a young deer Middle-aged deer, old deer. I mean, it gives them all kind of signals in the musk. And um, it's just, if you've never smelled real musk, it is literally on another level. No matter how good the synthetic deer musks are, and there's some really good ones, they'll never be able to compete with the real stuff. Ever, 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 ever. The real stuff is on a complete other level as far as I'm concerned. So Siberian musk comes in at number three. Number two is... Um, so hard to rank number two, number one, number three, but number two for me is um, what I would consider the most underrated Russian Adam fragrance. And you know what's funny is I've said that on the channel before, and I went back and looked at the video I made on this fragrance, and there's still like no views, um, which goes to show that some people just don't care, you know, because they're like, you know what, screw it, I'm never going to be able to own one of these rare fragrances anyways, but I think this is an absolute masterpiece. This is Inverno Russo. Uh, Inverno Russo is uh, a very interesting composition because the idea was that imagine you're sitting in inside while the Russian winter outside is, is blowing. Uh, there's snow everywhere. It's like a whiteout snowstorm, right? And so you get this white rose Alba Atta, which I mentioned from one of Sultan Pasha's uh, atars earlier. And this fragrance is made up of all these little co-distillations. So there's a white pepper absolute extracted by Russian Atom. Peach blossom and osmanthus co-absolutes extracted by Russian Atom. White frankincense distilled by Russian Atom. White gardenia, white champaca, clove, cardamom, Indian sandalwood, tonka bean absolute. Tincture of legally obtained wild Siberian musk pod and synthetic civet. And Russian Atom mentioned he, he tinctured both the pod and... So the powdery bits of the pod and the leathery aspects of the outside. Rare, wild, Hanan, agarwood oil aged over five years. Indian oud oil, white Indonesian, garu, boya, betel leaf, which is another um, note you don't find very often. 
Virginia Cedarwood and Benzoin. I think Inverno Russo is me 100% through and through. Two of my all-time favorite musk fragrances right here. Uh, and I'd love a full bottle of this, but... Um, and his new collection is coming out very soon. I think it's being released in like a couple hours. So, you know, this fragrance is perfect. Perfect timing. And that only leaves number one, which means, Ramsey, if you could... Take one Arise Ladore full bottle right now. I think I've concluded this would be it. If I can get an original bottle of this, this is the one I would go for. I love this fragrance. It is, they call it a raw, wild, naked, the true oud experience, and they're spot on. And this is like, if you were creating an oud for my personality, this would be it. Because this is multiple heavy types of oud mixed with animalics. It's basically like the animalic oud mixture. And this is called oud zen. Uh, and you can see, oh God, just seeing it half full is like, uh, I just want to, I just want to wear this as my scent of the day one day and just douse myself in this stuff. Um, it's so fucking good. Um, rare wild Sri Lankan agar wood oil distilled by Russian Adam, papau agar wood resin, Indian oud and 20 year old Indian saffron atar in here, Indian and Indonesian sandalwood. Clean Indian vetiver, tolu balsam, sweet myrrh, and traces of synthetic civet and castorium. So that castorium civet combo. Fuck, man. Um, it's so good. They say intense yet gentle, balsamic and silky smooth, and oud volcano, majestically smoking, slowly releasing the concoction of pure Sri Lankan and Indian ouds. Fuck, it's perfect. I mean, just absolutely perfect for me. I would love a bottle of this. Ramsey, you get one free bottle from Marie's Ladore. Go, this would probably be it. Although, his new collection has a fragrance called Royal Barn, which is apparently, Russian Adam was telling me, inspired by the way I described um, Vintage Queer de Russie by Chanel. Um, and, and so I'm going to review this one of these days as well, probably very soon, because, uh, but, and that one's called Royal Barn. So uh, his fragrance, Royal Barn, is inspired by yours truly, which is an absolute honor. And I feel like I should own a bottle, so maybe I will try to get one. But um, I probably won't be able to get it in time because it's coming out very, very soon. So uh, it's like, ready, set, go, and everyone's trying to click buy real quick. Um, but anyways, I am extremely, extremely excited to try his new collection. This has been my This Year in Perfume Uh 2017 and these fragrance these videos keep getting longer and longer and longer so let me know what you think i appreciate everyone watching commenting liking subscribing all the awesome stuff you guys do uh it's truly an honor to do these videos for you guys i hope you learned something hope you enjoy talking about a lot of fragrances like this let me know what your favorites are cheers guys and i'll catch you next time Bye bye